All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, I'm uh, Eric Romanathan, Executive Director of the Program of the Legal Profession. Uh, we're excited to kick off another semester uh, with a bunch of new programming. We have something pretty much planned for every Tuesday, uh, every week from now until the end of the semester. Uh, well, one of the things we spend a lot of time thinking about is how to help you all in the, your careers and uh, what law firm professional development uh, looks like and should look like. And uh, very pleased today to have uh, you know someone who's focused a lot of that. Well, he's a, a law firm corporate partner uh, and has been for many years, and, and frankly, a, a personal friend uh, as well. Uh, he spent a lot of time thinking about what is business development, what kind of misconceptions do folks uh, uh, tend to have about it, particularly when they're uh, coming in as, uh, as juniors, and how could we actually do business development better as we come up with it. So can I give you uh, Steve Epstein. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, for, sorry, can everybody hear me? I'm supposedly mic'd up. Um, First thing I'd like to do, which I haven't done before, I've done this now I think two or three years, and I just wanted to get a sense, how many of you are going to be joining a, a law firm that is uh, either you know, in some major city, whether it's in New York, Chicago, or somewhere else around the world, after graduation? Those are sheepish hands. Um, <laughs> okay, I got one more out of that. That's good. Um, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to ask that question is, you know, this really, this presentation really focuses and is based on, um, you know, my own experience, which is really derived out of practicing in New York, um, and why I think a lot of the lessons are transferable <laughs> to different markets. Uh, I, I do think this presentation is really geared toward kind of big law, um, bigger clients, and big cities, um, and I think you'll see as we go through why, why I say that. I, I, like I said, I think a lot of the things we'll talk about, uh, and hopefully what you'll leave with today, are things that you can actually do as you embark on your career, while they will be transferable to other markets, as a context, um, they, really, they really do apply to um, kind of the big law firms in, uh, in large legal markets. So. What I want to do is I want to try to make this interactive. I say this every year, and then it, it's less interactive than I, that I would like. So um, I'm going to say it off, and I'm going to actually try to do this where um, we leave a bunch of time for questions, because I think actually that's the, most, um, that's the most important part of the session, is answering. Nothing is off limits. Uh, you can ask me anything. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know your names, so you'll, you'll be, remain forever anonymous to me. Um, what I want to do quickly is, A, do an introduction and really try to talk to you about why this is important. You know, one of the things that is really disturbing to law firms uh, and then ultimately becomes disturbing to law firm lawyers after eight or nine years of practice when they, you know, it's foisted on them that all of a sudden business development is what's expected of you. Um, you really need to be thinking about it day one when you enter a law firm, even though many of the things that we'll talk about, you might say, you know, I really can't do that until I'm a mid-level, or I really can't do that until I'm a junior partner. Um, the reality is if you don't think about it and you're just asked to flip the switch 10 years into your practice, I promise you, uh, I promise you that nobody has been able to flip that switch successfully. So the most successful business developers, and you know, I can give you some, and hopefully we'll go through some, some real life examples. The most successful business developers have been thinking about it since they really started practicing law. And it's just a side pocket of the things that you need to think about in addition to obviously becoming great lawyers uh, and providing great legal service. This is not a... So should make this point. This is not an alternate career path in the sense that you know, you've got these law firm uh, agreement writers or brief writers, and then this is the circuit for the people who know how to lunch. It, it really doesn't work that way. It's really something that you need to be thinking about as you're also becoming great lawyers. So 
We're going to go through an introduction, why it matters, and then we'll talk about business development because I think a lot of times, and I know that when I was in your seat, uh, you know, not that long ago, <laughs> I think there's a misconception as to what business development is. A lot of people mistake networking for business development, and we'll go through why I think that's really uh, a mistake, and, and we'll talk about the differences between the two. And then hopefully we'll come away with actual things you can do because that's obviously what's most important uh, to you. So why is this business development a critical skill? So the first part of the question. It's critical because it's actually, it's your liberator. I was thinking about this on the uh, plane this morning. It is the most liberating thing to be in control of your time. And what ends up happening, what you're about to embark, for those of you who are going to a big <laughs> law firm, you're about to lose your liberty. Um, and so we, we make a lot of demands on your time. That's just the way it is. And that's what people are signing up to. And you're working in a large team, and there are certain things that have to happen. And so if you've got some commitment and someone else on your team has the commitment, basically what ends up happening in law firm life is you know, the person whose commitment uh, is least, uh, the person who has the least seniority usually loses out on their commitment. And that's kind of what you're, what you're signing up to. But with business development, I think as you have your own clients uh, and as people are calling on you to do legal services, it allows you to really take control not only of your time, but also of your career. And we'll talk about that a little bit too, about how important it is to manage your own career because every law firm uh, or every organization that you guys join will have an HR department and they'll talk about professional development and they'll have nicer slides than I have about it. The reality is no one is as interested in your career as you are. Um, and then how do you master that skill? Well, I would say that like anything else, what ends up happening is some of you are going to be great at this, some of you are going to be less great, but it is a skill. It's not something that, you know, you've got a genetic predisposition to doing this. Um, this is something that you can learn. There are some things you can do early on that are going to prepare you for what's going to happen as you're called upon to do more and more. And I will tell you again, just to kind of, whatever the euphemism you want to use, lift the skirt, open the kimono. Um, in eight years from now, if you are still in law firm land and you are interested in becoming a partner, whether or not your law firm is uh, telling you this along the way, and hopefully they are, this will become a discussion in your eight, nine, whatever the partner track is in that particular law firm as to whether or not you can do this. Because ultimately, what people care about besides great legal work is how are you going to bring dollars in the door? That's just the, the reality. Okay, so we talked a little bit before about the context. What, what do you do? What, what I wanted to do on this slide is just to help delineate exactly what's expected of you at different points in your career. Um, obviously, there, the lists go, can go on and on and on. But if you're, some or so, if you're going to be summer associate, uh, first year associate, and kind of through your third year, it really is the most important <laughs> thing is picking up all the skills, right? Because you're not going to be able to all of a sudden say, you know, I really dropped the ball the first two years, now I'll pick it up. It just doesn't really work that way. So in the beginning, for sure, your primary focus is going to be, how do I do great work? How do I figure out, frankly, what it is that I'm interested in first? And what actually makes me enthusiastic to come to work every day? And then, how do I master the skills required? So if it's, I'm an M&A lawyer. Um, you know, I've never done anything but M&A as a, as a lawyer. I, I was a banker for a couple of years as well. Um, you know, I don't know how to do capital markets. I don't know how to do finance. I don't know how to do litigation. But those are all the things um, that I've been able to sell to clients. And the reason you're going to ultimately, and we'll talk about how you do this, but the reason you're ultimately going to be able to sell those to clients uh, those other areas is because you're going to have a deep understanding of what it is you do. And once you have a deep understanding of what it is you do, you understand how that fits in the 
kind of a larger scheme of a transaction or a company's life. So for instance, you're representing a public company and they're doing M&A deals. You also have to understand that they've got a public stock, that they've got corporate governance issues, that sometimes they get sued, et cetera. And that helps you fill out what it is that you can sell. You kind of you know, overlay what your firm can do versus what that client needs. And that's what you figure out how to sell into that client. But again, in the beginning, We've got build legal skills. While you're doing that, and I don't want to spend too much time on the last three steps because it seems like a lifetime away probably from where you're sitting. <laughs> while you're doing that, what, you know, what is it that you can do that while you build the skills, you also are thinking about business development? <laughs> well, one of the things is A, staying in touch with all your classmates. Um, for me, that, as I kind of think back, I didn't think this way again in law school, but my largest client is somebody that I went to law school with. Um, and we weren't even that good friends in law school, just somebody that I, that I knew, and then we ended up working at the same firm and so on, and um, it, it just kind of grew into that. So I think a law school network is obviously key because a lot of you will become consumers of legal services if you go in-house. And in all likelihood, you want to buy those services from people you know and presumably, uh, presumably trust. So growing your network, let's just talk about beyond law school, right? Because a lot of times, I remember, when you're in law school, it's so confining. You see the same people, same time, all the time. You, you want to like, get out. You don't want to spend extra time with the same people that you, know, you sit with in class. So growing your network is obviously very important. One of the things that people, again, lose sight of is you've had so many touch points. I've got a slide on this that I call connecting the dots. You've got so many touch points before you got to law school in terms of high school and college and work, you know, some of you probably at this point uh, have work experiences before law school. And so all of those things are important to stay on top of. And when I say stay on top of, recognizing you're all very busy, you're gonna have a limited amount of time to interact with these people, but these are all people that you need to keep in the back of your mind because ultimately, that will be the network that you tap. Nobody, you know, when you make partner as an example, nobody kind of whips out a secret list and says, now you, here's your new Rolodex, you're like, you're all set, and just start dialing and somebody will hire you. So it's really, it, it ultimately is going to be your own Rolodex, and that's something that you need to, to build. I'm not suggesting, by the way, in some Machiavellian way that you build friendships so that you can then get business. I'm just saying that don't lose track of people as easily as you might otherwise have done, because ultimately it does come <laughs> full circle for you from a business development standpoint. Okay. What is this? You know, I have a partner who is the head of our real estate practice, who's an amazing guy. He has a he has this party in in New York uh, every year for fourteen hundred people, and um, it's like the real estate party. And I I got invited to it once, and it was like a who's who of re I don't know anything about real estate other than it's expensive and the city I live in. And so, but I was walking through this party, and you see like Donald Trump over there and some other real estate guy over there. And he really does, and so I've asked him about it, how does he think about business development? He really does say this, that it's automatic like breathing. You know, his, he's just always thinking about how it is that I can do really the second bullet point, which is create value, not just for yourself. I, that's something that we should uh, spend some time on. You know, right now you don't have a ton maybe to offer other people, right? You've got availability and enthusiasm, and, that, and that's, kind of, that's kind of it. And, but that's a lot, actually. That's a lot. And um, I, I think what, what ends up happening is that law firm life, I was just giving this presentation to our first year associates, you know, law firm life has a way of like knocking all of the enthusiasm out of you because you're, you know, you're eating Chinese food at three in the morning, you're flipping pages on an interminable document, you're waiting for somebody to get back to you with comments, 
uh, you know, comments are actually, that's a word that becomes part of your everyday vernacular. Uh, you're waiting for comments, you're turning comments, you're flipping comments. Um, and so a lot of times all the things that make you fun and interesting that you've spent all these years building, you know, like your parents sending you to like cello lessons or whatever it is to make you more fascinating individuals, it kind of gets knocked out of you in law firm life. And what I'm suggesting is don't let that happen. Okay, don't let that happen. Don't let us do that to you. Um, because those are the things that actually make you enjoyable to be around. And if I had to boil it down, most people want to work with people they have fun being around. And if you're fun to be around, chances are you're going to have more clients. And the more, cl the more clients you have, the more relevant you're going to be in your firm. And the more relevant you're going to be in your firm, the more enjoyment you're going to have out of your career. So I really get it. it it's kind of a bummer to me to meet lawyers who are like, yeah, I'm a lawyer. Like they, you know, they're, they're really unhappy and they're carrying the burden of the world <laughs> on their shoulders. And it, it, it can be a lot of fun. And I just encourage you not to lose that because I think that you all come to it, and I know I did, with a lot of enthusiasm. And then at some point after your you know, 300th night at the firm or something, you something happens, and I just uh, don't turn that off. But uh, creating value can be many, many different things. So for, as an example, you have a friend who's in the business school, and that person becomes an associate at a private equity firm. And you know that they're focused, that private equity firm is focused on healthcare. And your firm happens to have a great healthcare regulatory practice. And you know, you put out some interesting piece on, some partner puts out an interesting piece on some legislation that just got adopted. Or uh, you have an event where, you know, the head of the FDA is coming to the firm to speak to clients. Those are opportunities where you can connect people to opportunities for themselves and not for you. So you can try to get your friend an invitation to that client event. You can send that article, not in a spam-like way that we all just delete, but actually put some kind of personalized email in front of it and say, hey, I know that you're working in this area. I thought this might be interesting. You'd be surprised how many times those little things actually drive business. And you need to be thinking about those things, not just thinking about, you know, what's my next billable hour? You know, and that, that, that I think is, is really uh, important. Let me just see. Here we go. Okay. Now, networking versus uh, business development. I, I, the reason I kept flipping back is if you look at the takeaway box in the bottom, you know, business development in my mind is actually getting hired, like ringing the cash register. That's what business development is. Versus networking is, hey, I know you, now I'd like to know you, now I'd like to know you. Maybe one day we'll, you know, I'll bring the cash register with that person, but that's not the same exact thing. And so networking is really important, particularly as you're more junior in your career, because that's what you can do. That's the easiest thing you can do, but it's also <coughs> the most important thing you can do because it broadens the network. And so you can... You know, I, I've got some affiliations that I'm sure all of you are um, comfortable in. But one of the things that's really difficult, I find, for lawyers for some reason, and, and again, I drive back to you were all at one point dynamic people. Okay, that's why you're here. That's why you got into the schools you got into. Um, I, I find it funny because lawyers will go to an event and maybe this is not just a lawyer thing, it's a people thing, and they'll beeline to the one person out of 400 that they know in that room. And now you're at the Harvard Club in New York City at an event, and you're talking to the one person you already knew, and you're hoping, just hoping that somebody else knows that person that you don't, and that way you'll get to triangulate and meet someone else. <coughs> don't do that. You have to be... You know, that's what I'm talking about when I say get comfortable in the zone of discomfort. Like, it's not comfortable to go in and, you know, you just got your business card. You don't really even know how to take it out yet. You don't know where you put it. Um, you know, you've 
they finally taken the asterisk <laughs> off your name that says law clerk or whatever it is that we do when you first join. Yeah, this just happened to you. But you're still, you're, you're a grown person and you're fun and you have experiences that people, not like, hey, I'd really like to talk to you about the new 12G rules. But like, you know, I, it, you've got experience, travel experiences, life experiences, et cetera. So you really need to go into those settings where you have 400 people coming to an event with that mindset. And I'm not saying you're the guy like handing out neck braces on the way out or you're going to get, you know, that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about business development or networking. I'm just saying that your idea is I'm going to go to an event. I'm going to meet at least one person that I didn't know. Maybe that person is going to be a great client one day, maybe not. But that's less important than, hey, I'm gonna meet one more interesting person that I didn't know. And I think if you approach it that way, as opposed to, you know, how many dollars I'm gonna suck out when I'm a partner at this firm, <laughs> you're gonna be a lot more successful. Um, but there is a difference between that and business development. And the business development part is, one of the things that you need to do when we talked about the first three years, hey, I really need to get good at this law thing, you also really need to learn your firm. One of the things that I was actually uh, talking to, was doing a presentation on, not exactly this presentation, but a, a, top, a similar topic to our litigation department last week. And one of the things that people were saying, well, how do you cross sell? That's a big buzzword in law firms these days. Like, how do you as a <coughs> corporate partner cross sell litigation and how can we do the same? And one of the things I said is, you know, you have to actually know the firm and it sounds so simplistic, but here's what happens on a regular pitch, and I, I bear witness to this often. People, somebody comes in, the litigation partner has, a, has the relationship with the particular client, and the litigation partner says, I've got this great guy, I mean, he's a terrific M&A lawyer, he's the global head of M&A at our firm, and he does work with all our big clients, you really should meet him. That is a complete wasted pitch. Because that's just a bunch of hyperbole that doesn't really mean anything. And what I would suggest to you is if you really learn the firm, know what clients your firm represents, know what deals they do, know what litigations, know that the difference between you know, uh, a litigator that really focuses on white collar criminal stuff versus a litigator <laughs> that focuses on SEC <coughs> investigations, because there is a difference. Um, Know your firm really well. Know the, the footprint of the <coughs> firm. Know that you have an office in Hong Kong, not we're somewhere in Asia. Know that you know, we've, got, we've got offices in you know, the UK, and hopefully you know, you know this London place and stuff. Like, you, know, you, just, you have to know that, and you have to be conversant, in, and you have to be comfortable with explaining it, because that is a much deeper and richer sell. And so you're thinking to yourself probably, I'm so far away from the sell thing, like what is he talking about? When I'm talking about sell, I'm not talking about, oh, I go to a, an auditorium like this with 50 executives, and then I hope that somebody at the end kind of bum rushes me and you know, hands me a deal. I'm talking about when you're, to, when you're discussing <laughs> with your banker friend at B of A, hey, what is it that you do every day? You don't want to say, and your banker is a, capital markets banker, and you happen to be a capital markets lawyer, uh, you don't say, well, I just uh, you know, read a bunch of prospectuses. You want to take that opportunity to actually say something intelligent about your group. Why? Because that person might say, hmm, OK, this really overlays with what I do. Maybe I like this person enough to have been having dinner with them uh, on an, in a non-business context, why wouldn't I want to work with them? So you have to really be able to, A, explain what you do in a very cogent, clear, and hopefully not monotone way. And then you have to also be, think about what is it that you can say that will make me highly relevant to this person from a business standpoint. Um, so know your firm. The other thing I would just uh, caution against, you know, you're here at, at, at Harvard and you have like these great contacts that, you're, that you've had and that you're building and so on. 
And so there's a real, um, you know, we all want to we all want to look heroic, right? And so we go into to the law firm and you say, you know, I've got this buddy. He graduated three years ago, and he's killing it on Wall Street. And so I'm going to go and, and and pitch. He's at uh, pick a firm, Blackstone, and um, I'm going to go and pitch the firm to him. And uh, when I land this, they're just my ascent at the firm could not be any faster. They will crown me by the time the first bonus season comes around. And I will just tell you that that is a very dangerous and um, it's a missed opportunity because at most of these things you only have one shot, and particularly if you're junior but you happen to have great relationships, it's a great opportunity for you to say to a partner. Hopefully, somebody that you know doesn't um, is good with people. But you say to a, you say to a partner, "Hey, I have a great relationship with Blackstone. I know we don't do any work for Blackstone. I would love to figure out a way to get in front of them. Who do you think the best people would be to do that? That's what you're, That's why you're working at a law firm. Okay. Otherwise, you'd just be solo practitioners. And so." It's really important not to flub that first opportunity because, again, for the next several years, you're not going to have a ton of at-bats. But you might have one here and one there, and so using it wisely is really, really important. <coughs> um, okay. That's an approach that didn't, didn't work for me. But um, All right, so we'll skip over this. You've heard all this to be a good listener or whatever. Hey, it's a lot like dating skills. Uh, okay. That's, I'm coming back next week, Eric, for that one. Um, all right, connecting the dots. So I was talking about this before. Really, I mean, there's no secret sauce, right? But this is, if I had to say the sl my secret sauce slide, this is really it. You want to talk about, you think about what your access points are. Really, we talked about before, your affiliations and... Um, groups and things you're interested in and uh, people you know from, from different walks of life. You want to think about those and you literally want to create a list. Uh, the reason you want to create a list is because it just helps you I think, figure out, okay, this, when you put it down on paper, some of the stuff that sounds good but is sort of laughable isn't laughable when it's in your head, but when you put it down on paper, you're like, no. Nah. And you okay, cross it out. One of the th you're really far away from this, but I will tell you just one of the secrets of this whole game is crossing people out is actually more important than adding people in. And the reason I say that is if you are good at this, and you'll know whether you are or not, if you're good at this and you've tried to develop business from a particular person in many different ways, and you can tell that that person either isn't driving the legal purchasing decision, isn't interested in working with you, thinks you're a dope, whatever. Whatever the, the reason is, you need to cross them off because you're wasting time. Time is really the, one of the most precious things you'll have when you get out of this place. And, you know, I, I, um, there's, a, there's a young, uh, young partner who is really excited about business development at my firm and he was talking to, he, you know, he wanted me to come on a, on a pitch with him and he said, um, what do you think we should do? Should we um, take this guy to a Nick game uh, or dinner or both? And I said, well, tell me about this opportunity. And I said, well, I think, I think this is really, sorry, I think this is really a breakfast. He said, what, what are you talking about? What's the difference? I was like, well, because you know, you don't want to kill a night, right? With, there's, there's like a pyramid of people that you have to have in your head, right? Like if somebody is a high value target, like, hey, this person's a general counsel of a Fortune 50 company, right? You don't want to like say, hey, let's meet at Starbucks, right? If the person's at a Fortune, <laughs> that, that type of person, you get one opportunity, yeah, you want to set up that, that important dinner. You want to set up that, hey, I want to take them to a front row at Yankee Stadium. 
I want to kill the night with my family uh, to do this. But if the person is, hey, I met this person on a plane and he happens to work at XYZ private equity shop, well, that's a great person you can have breakfast with. The reason I say that is not to, to sort of give you my look, thoughts on meals, but it's just <laughs> you, you, what you really need to be thinking about is you've got a limited amount of time, right? You're working, you know, hopefully if I'm doing my job, like 15, 16, 17 hours a day, right? You're not... You're not, really, you're not really hanging out and saying, gee, I wish I could take a random stranger to a meal, right? So you need to be thinking why, sort of think about it. And most of your firms, I know uh, at Freed Frank, we have, a, we have a budget, not to do a commercial, but since I'm in the Sherman and Sterling classroom, <laughs> I feel like I can. Um, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of um, firms now do this, have budgets for, its, for associates to take potential clients out for different things. Now, it's not like hop on the Concord and go to the French Open kind of budget, but it's uh, a budget to, you could take people out for drinks, you could take people out for a meal, et cetera. But it's not the money. So you'll get the money reimbursed. It's really your time. And so you really do need to segment who you know into how much time you're gonna spend with them. Again, following the former, uh, the, the opportunities through colleagues, uh, and uh, former classmates. You know, we talked about knowing the firm. Uh, on execution, I think you really need to, again, think about these opportunities as they're not going to come up that often. I mean, even today, I will tell you that I have a list, and that this list, every time I go on a plane, you know, I work my list and I cross stuff off, I add stuff on, I say, yeah, you know, now this is laughable. So, so that kind of thing. You have to keep keep doing that. But once you get that opportunity, you have to make sure that the execution is flawless. And what I mean by that is you can't have a situation. This is a lot of uh, one of my partners do this. I lo I love when this happens. So we got a uh, you got a pitch. It's at ten o'clock Boston, okay. And I'm sitting in New York. And people say, and then this is it. This is like the holy grail pitch. This is, you can't get better than this. And people are talking about, you're sitting, let's just say it's January. And people are sitting in New York saying, okay, so I'm going to grab the 8 o'clock shuttle. We'll hop, get in there 9.20. It's 15 minutes to the office. Boom, we're there for 10. No. Okay. If this is your opportunity, you basically, you, you have to guard those opportunities and you have to say no okay either you're in or you're out you either have to fly on like a 7 a.m. shuttle so we leave ourselves time nobody wants you that badly nobody wants you that badly that you can walk into that pitch 15 minutes late hey no big deal we're coming from New York nobody cares so everything from that to having the right people in the room and we talked about this before if you can get uh, senior members of the firm to join your pitch team, that's key. And then the last thing is, and this is what clients hate, I'm sure Eric when he was a client hated this, you, um, you show up okay, and you say, here I want to do this M&A deal and here, here, here are the people. And then you actually get hired and none of the people are ever seen again doing that deal. Okay? <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, don't do that to yourself. You have to make sure that your institution is going to say, hey, this is not just the pitch team, this is actually the execution team. And that's why I say it's very important for you to bring senior people because you as associates will never be able to deliver the firm in the way that a senior person will. And that's something that you have to do. That's what clients ultimately want you to do. All right, so, okay. Uh, you know, b besides, I, I can never, you know, I've had this now guy for a couple of years. I could never find a less sort of smarmy looking guy. Uh, and if you have one, email him to me. I'll put him in next year. Um, so <clears throat> I would say talk less, listen more is a good one. Okay. I think lawyers have, uh, have a tendency, particularly when you're uncomfortable in a sort of a pitch situation, 
a lot of blah, blah, blah. We have seven offices in all the locations you would ever need. We do everything for everybody all the time. We do, you know, you really want to spend less time talking and more time intaking, hey, what is this person really looking for? Are they really upset because their last firm is no longer paying attention to them? Or are they really upset because they really st they started a new business in a geography and a firm told them they could do it, but then fell short? Are they really upset about um, the fact that their relationship partner retired and the firm didn't produce somebody of sort of equal ability for them to work with? Uh, it can be a million different things, but you'll never understand those things if you do all the talking. So you really need to figure out, A, uh, what is it that your client, what business is your client in? Know something about that business. Don't be afraid to tap your, this is where your investment banking <coughs> funds are good, okay? They get, they can get access to research reports on different companies. Reading research reports on companies or reading uh, even the website of the company is really important before you go out and, and do your do your pitch. So the execution here, uh, the execution is key, but talking too much is not. Knowing a lot about the company, knowing a lot about the client is, and being able to not dump the data on the person. Hey, I know you have five funds, it's fully invested, this one's, no. But knowing that data is important so you can layer it in when it's appropriate in a conversation. Remember, no one's hiring you because you know everything. Right. By the way, I, I, this is an interesting question. I, I asked this uh, in the uh, first year associate presentation that I did. What do you think, what do you think you're selling as a lawyer? I have no name tags. So I'm going to have to go with like shirt colors. Anybody? What do you think you're selling as a lawyer? I got to get some volunteer. How about the the you note pad? Credibility, right? To any form of transaction. Credib okay, credibility. I like that one. Anyone else? Competence. Competence. I like, that. like an opinion. Second opinion, okay. Well, hopefully some extra value. You have to deliver more value than your fee. So I think, yeah, so I like confidence and, and, and value. What I was, the word I'm looking for is, uh, is judgment. Because ultimately, see, now everybody basically has ripped off each other's papers, right? Everything's public. So it's not like I've got a better merger agreement than the next guy. Right? And I don't have a better employment agreement because that's available too. I don't have better uh, motion papers, they're public too. So ultimately, <coughs> if they're going to pay you $1,000 an hour versus the next guy $1,000 an hour, what is it that you sell? And the only thing that's left, actually, is we don't, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any technology beyond tax technology. That's really tax and maybe patents where one firm is truly superior to another firm. And even then, it is difficult for a client to decipher that superiority in a pitch. So the only thing you can really sell is judgment. It's whether or not that person across the table believes that they can entrust what to them is the most important thing in their career at that particular moment to you. And that's really hard. I actually find it very hard. You know, if you have hair and it's not gray, um, it's it's really difficult. So you have to. Um, it's it's really difficult to convince somebody that hey, this most important thing to you, the thing that your credibility hinges on. I, I'm okay. You know, like hire the new guy. Um, and I think that selling judgment. If you think about it in terms of <clears throat> selling judgment. It's really um, important. Now, how do you communicate that you have more judgment than the next guy? It's not because you have, uh, you know, you've surveyed the last 15 transactions and they've all come, you know, the MAE definition has all come out this way. That shows 
that you're too gran that you're so granular that you're never going to be able to be this person's business partner and thought partner. Okay? You have to figure out how to demonstrate that yes, you know that. Of course you have uh, the competence, as you say. Yes. But you're able to translate that competence into judgment. And that's a that is that that is a trick. Uh, that <coughs> yeah, trick's a bad word. That is what you need to do, but there is no, hey, this is how I do it. You have it actually is different, I find, for every single client. You know, for those who are younger, uh, maybe entrepreneurs, and you're representing people in Silicon Valley, that judgment is communicated by um, being conversant in the technology, frankly, much more so than being conversant in the clauses of a contract. Versus that judgment, if you're pitching a Fortune 50 CEO, very t difficult to communicate. Actually, for those pitches, to be honest with you, what I still do is I, I always bring like the the older set, uh, you know, the the people that I call with intergalactic titles at my firm, and you bring them in, and then it's actually not embarrassing because you don't have to say anything positive about yourself. They can point to you and say, you know, that guy can make the elephant dance. You know, he will deliver the firm. And then all you got to do is actually talk about it. Substance, you don't have to say, hey, I'm, I'm really awesome. So, um, sometimes, I mean, once or twice you can slip that in. But, um, but I think that, that for each situation, demonstrating that judgment is different. And that's, that's something that you're going to get more nimble with as you get more, more senior and you're kind of immersed in this. All right, so I want to flip to the last. For, since I put it in, I'll, I'll show it. Right? Uh, that's not a place you want to be. OK. All right, so last point is you got to think about your plan. What can you do right now? So I, we talked about the list of people you know. We talked about um, staying current with people that are not in it right in front of you, right? Just because they're not sitting in your law school classroom doesn't mean that you need to lose touch with them. Um, you also one of the things you're going to do is it, when you fir when you get into a law firm. One of the first things that's going to happen, you're going to be put on a transaction. You're going to be put on a litigation. Keep that list. Now, I used to, uh, it's dating me now, but I used to work at our, a place called Arthur Anderson, which now is like a, you know, in the history books, I guess, I'm no longer around. But um, there's a guy at Arthur Anderson, he was a, a partner in the New York office who, for some reason, we're sitting around, and he was giving kind of dispensing unsolicited advice, and which was good. And you know, he said you should keep a list of everything you've ever done. And I thought to myself, wow, how weird! Like, who cares? You know, I have a hard enough time making it interesting for people who care about me, what I'm doing during the day. Like, why would anyone else care? Um, but actually, that list is hugely important. So I've got my transaction list to this day, and I've written on it every single transaction I've ever worked on. And it's kind of a laughable sheet of paper when you first start, right? You got like one thing on it, and you kind of center it, and then you're not really sure what to do. <laughs> uh, but but over time, it builds. And now that I can say, hey, what have you done? Like, why are you the right M&A lawyer? I could whip out whatever it is. Now it's up to, you know, that's how, you know, you're getting older. It's got sheets and sheets and sheets of paper. And so, say, okay, what healthcare deals have you done? And now I can say, okay, well, you know, I've done these six over the years. That is actually very, very compelling for people. Now you're not gonna, again, day one, you're not gonna have that. But you really need to start keeping, keeping that list. So. And the last thing I would say, again, just to start off with, is network. Don't, again, you're going to go into your, a firm, you're going to go into a work environment, and you kind of have a, there's an ability that, to get lost in that environment. 
There's an ability to just stay within that, hey, I'm going to go out with these work friends. Hey, these people are going for drinks, so I'm going to go with that. Continue to think about how do you broaden your network, how when you go to a different city on a business trip you catch up with that old friend, how you reconnect with people in a way that's natural, not stilted. But, you know, like when you, you make partner and you like show up in <coughs> London one day and you kind of call somebody up and say, hey, remember when we were in law school 15 years ago? I'm in London. Like, that's not going to work. Right? So you need, to, you need to keep it current. There are many, many ways you can do that. I'll leave you with the last tip, which is you know, your law firm produces a lot of paper. Your organization, it's not a law firm, produces a lot of paper. There are many, many ways to use that paper to your advantage. So again, we talked about memos that might be interesting to friends and uh, and colleagues, holiday cards. I know, I know this is going to be totally not cool and it's on tape, whatever, but people still like actually getting the piece of paper. They like that. You know why? Because if it comes in on my Blackberry, there's no chance that I'm like clicking through and then I get an error message, then I got to go back to my desktop and click through and then wait for 13 seconds and like the, the, the lights explode and then there's a message to you. Okay, people want that card that says not a lot, it could say 10 words on it. Hey, let me know when you're next in New York. Happy holidays. I think that's seven. Okay, like you don't need much more than that. But it really is a way to just touch base with somebody once a year. Um, a client event that you get somebody invited to, that's once a year. An article that you might send to somebody, that's once a year. More than that, you become annoying, right? So you don't want to necessarily be in front of the person every single week. I'm just saying, here are three easy ways you can do it three times a year. There are other things, obviously, depending <laughs> on your relationship with somebody, a birthday card, a, um, you know, another ho different holiday that, they, you know, that that person might celebrate, etc. But it's, it's a way to stay in front of somebody without being in your face. And I think that's what you really want to do. You want to hang around the hoop early in your career while you're building the skill set so that later on you can actually do the business development part. Obviously, that's important. I don't think anybody's hiring you because they're following you on Twitter, like hashtag lawyer, hashtag buy me now. You know? so, like, I think, I think people, <clears throat> yes, it's a good way to stay in touch. I would just, I would put it out there, and, and you know, you can test this out. If you are on Facebook, Okay, I happen not to be on Facebook, but <laughs> I know that's shocking to you. But um, I would just say that it is, there is more, it's a great way to stay in touch with somebody. And for that, from that standpoint, I actually think that's a failing of mine because that's a great way to be able to stay in touch with somebody that you otherwise would not reach out to and continue to keep that network alive. And so for that purpose, I think the Facebook thing works. And particularly it works if you already have a pre-existing friendship with the person as opposed to business relationship. But I would just put out there that if it's a business relationship, meaning, and when I say business relationship, I mean either you meet the person on a transaction. Okay, so I work on a transaction, I meet a JP Morgan banker. Okay, if I friend him, it's gonna be a little weird. Right, it's gonna be a little weird. So I think that it depends on, and that's the judgment part, um, it depends on the context in which you're doing it. You have a LinkedIn account, you have a LinkedIn, you send in a LinkedIn kind of invite to the, that J, same JP Morgan banker, okay, that's okay. But I think if you send them an email saying follow me on Twitter, a little weird too. Right? So I think that you gotta, you got to figure out how to use it appropriately. And I think what ends up happening is there's so much room to misstep in the social media context that 
you can immediately you can spend a lot of time building up your reputation as a serious person in front of that person's eyes and then ruin it because you friend them on Facebook and somebody puts something on that's embarrassing and all of a sudden the global head of healthcare at JP Morgan knows something that you don't want him or her to know. It's just that it, it be, so it becomes very uh, it becomes dangerous. I do think on the business side of the social media stuff, the LinkedIn stuff, it becomes it, it's it's safer. The only thing I would say to you with LinkedIn that I've noticed is really uh, disturbing is if you let yourself get into that, into the LinkedIn network, and you're on LinkedIn, and so I know you, okay, you know me, <clears throat> and we're happy to be LinkedIn, right? But then somebody is looking for a job who you know, and that person wants to contact me. The danger is, and I, I've kind of seen this happen, not with me, but with, uh, with someone I know, is all of a sudden <clears throat> you're put in this very uncomfortable position where you and I are friends. You have a friend I don't know, but that friend thinks he has an opportunity at my firm. And through you, <clears throat> reaches out to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Reaches out to me. Now I'm in this awkward position. You know, you're my buddy. Now I gotta, <clears throat> you know, neg your friend because I have no interest in hiring him. It becomes a, a little bit uncomfortable. So that's the only thing I, I've seen with LinkedIn that becomes a little dangerous. And I don't know if there's a way you can stop that on LinkedIn where other people can see your contacts. But if you can't, then it becomes like you're a conduit to multiple job opportunities. And that's where it gets a little bit, it can get a little bit uncomfortable in this one situation it did. Well, I think one of the things, if you're in a small practice group in a large firm, one of the things you have to do is actually, one of your client bases is actually the other partners at the firm. Because they have, see, one of the things is your Rolodex is never going to be good enough to capture as much as you could capture if you leveraged everybody else's Rolodex. I mean, that's the point of LinkedIn, really, right? Um, so you have to, in a smaller group at a firm, I think what ends up happening is you have to use your other lawyers in that firm to talk about your services. I'll give you a real life example of how we've done that. We had no asset management practice 15 years ago, none. And someone started it and it was a small group and basically through leveraging the other clients of the firm and funneling them into asset management, if they had asset management stuff to do, they went somewhere else. Well now we have a group that does it you funnel them in there, you do a great job, and you build the practice, which, which is something that we've done. But it's very difficult to, to do on your own and just go out and get new clients. So if you're in a smaller practice, if you find yourself in a smaller practice group or not the biggest revenue producing practice group <coughs> in the firm, using the other firm practice groups as a way to build clients is also uh, you know, something that you need to, to think about. So basically the beautiful thing about um, the work world now is, is uh, nobody stays anywhere very long, you know? And so uh, there obviously, I joke about that, there are obviously some negatives to that. But the positive is that the junior banker that you're working with today, the junior in-house lawyer that you're working with today is a general counsel tomorrow. That banker is an MD somewhere tomorrow. That banker might be at a private equity firm tomorrow. Or he or she might be the head of business development at a large company tomorrow. So I think what you need to do is don't, you know, don't swing for the fences. Don't necessarily say, OK, I'm on a transaction. I'm going to do something so amazing that the, you know, the CEO is going to notice me. And usually what happens is if the CEO notices you, it's because you're getting fired. Right? <laughs> so, so, you really need to figure out, okay, how do I bridge to the person at my level at these other institutions and stay current with them? And then they will go other places. I mean, one of the things of my own problem, very impatient. 
So when I was told that answer to that very question, I was like, okay, that's going to take forever. But, you know, it does, time moves quickly, and you'd be surprised how quickly people get into, you know, positions of authority. All right. Thank you very much. It was really nice.